We do have a museum in here, and it's not open right now. But this is where the 54th Regiment came on Solitary Island. This is where they stayed overnight. They had camp here, and this is where they stayed before they moved on. But they started here from the water. They came up from the water, and I think they end up on John's Island from here. Solitary, a small coastal community on James Island, famous for its historic Mosquito Beach, a recreational oasis created by and for local African Americans, and one of only six beaches accessible to the African American community in the Charleston area during the segregated days of Jim Crow. The beach, whose boardwalk pavilion, restaurant, stores, music club, and hotels once attracted people from all over the low country and beyond, is just a piece of what makes Soul Agree so special. The Solgree community is a, an island bordered by the Folly, some people say Folly, but we Solgree River on the front end and on the back end we have the Holland Creek River and we end up on the uh, Stano River uh, where we have a boat landing and, and uh, a newly paved and built uh, pavilion on that end. We are a community of families and one way or another all of us are connected. The Richardsons, the Walkers, the Wilders, the Browns and the Backmans, the Greens, the Chavises, Wallaces are up there also, the Lafayette, the Gilliards, Singleton, and also the Grants that were, was here all of my lifetime. Um, and so that, that's who we are. We are one man's children. There was a, an Englander uh, that moved to the Charleston area in the 1800s. His name was Saul Legree. This land was actually abandoned because uh, the white community found that it was hard to grow anything here. So in the essence of it, it was sold to five men and those five men sold this portion to a family of freed men. And so that's the Saul Agree community. So talk about what Saul Agree was like when you were growing up. <laughs> it was paradise and still is to me. Uh, paradise because in this community uh, everybody was family and still is and uh, nobody went hungry. We were taught the morals of life um, not only by our parents but any house that you passed in walking down the street you had to govern yourself accordingly uh, because uh, those family members were watching out for you and and we were taught that we did not just represent ourselves, we represented our family. Because the elders may not have known our names, but they knew who we are by the shape of our face and the structure of our body. They knew who we were, they could identify us. And, um, and uh, they never really called your name. They just said, hey you, you Tim and Joe Grant, come over here. You know, because yeah. that's what they how they identified me. We, uh, really didn't even experience fenced yards. People may have had hedges, but you know, people left and came back home and then they put up these big fences, and meaning that everybody else had to stay out or ask permission to come in when we were accustomed to walking through each other's yard without a problem, so. Speaking of this village, when did you start noticing this village changing? The transition of change began to, to happen once a lot of the family members began to sell out their property and we identified a problem in that because they didn't have the same connection to the land that many of us who stayed here did so it didn't bother them to sell it and, and it disturbed us at, at, disturbed us at the core to know that uh, they were just blatantly selling it off. It makes me feel uh, very hurt and disappointed that uh, so many of our children don't have the same connection to the land that we do and don't recognize the value of it. So my thoughts are, why are you going to sell land and go rent from somebody else? Well, that money don't last very long, you know. When people hear a figure like, oh, we're going to get two hundred fifty or $300,000 uh, from the sale of this property. But divide that by eight <laughs> or even ten, <laughs> you know and uh, because they had larger families back then. It's a hurtful thing because the people were holding on to the land for them to come back home and live here and, and uh, to know that they don't want to do that. It gives us a lot to think about. Yeah. Identification is definitely, you know, setting in from 
all ends and the middle. Now, uh, do the residents really understand what is happening when you start selling your land like that? Probably not, but uh, they're selling the land maybe because the kids are not coming back. However, when the land is sold to somebody, then you are not sure what they're gonna do with it. And if they come in with uh, a subdivision, so that starts you know, at one end and you can add on, add on, and you go on down. For instance, at the beginning of uh, Southerly Road, we have a new development there. I think it's about 36 homes that they uh, built over there, King's Flat. And um, further down, uh, we have Brown Pelican is another community that has uh, been built on Solidary Road. And then when you go to the end, you do see a totally different group of people there. Next thing you know, the community is, might be gone. So, so that's something that we don't wanna see happen. We are trying to uh, educate people, uh, the children mostly, uh, and grandchildren of the original property owners to let them see they have some value in the land and why not keep the land and you spread it out among your family members because God is not making any more land. So this <laughs> land that we're on right now, about how many heirs you think are, are tied into this property right here? Ooh, besides Ooh. my father's nine sisters and brothers and three more cousins i'd say about 12. 12 of y'all yes. and does your land go from that water all the way to the dam yes. yes 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 what do you feel is the disconnect between your generation and maybe the younger richardson's in terms of like you know having a value and a love for this land what do you think is the disconnect between the two generations really teaching them the value of the land generation now don't see the prosper of this land and how, what it values because they into a different life. When we are the adults now know that our value of our property and would like to keep it in the family because of the beauty of it and what our ears, our ancestors have developed it for us, why can't we keep it like that? And is someone in your generation teaching that to the younger generation? We are trying. Yeah? yeah. We are trying. So we teach our children, bit. and our children teach our grandchildren. Yeah. The value of our great-grandfather, our grandfather, this property is beautiful. Don't let it go. And this property that we're on now, whose family is, is does this belong to? The Singleton family. This is y'all, so from here, back across the street, way back to the dike, um, back to the water, from water to water. Okay. As a matter of fact, my grandmother, Sarah Singleton, she owns about eight acres of land on that island over there. Oh, what island is that? Dixon Island. Dixon Island, okay. I mean, seeing this is so beautiful, why do you think that there are younger people my age who may have ties to this land that, that don't want this? Like, why wouldn't they want this? Well, I think the younger generation, um, didn't grow up in this area, so they don't have um, a feel for the value of the land. And another thing is economics. It has become very expensive to develop property over here now. Because we are in a flood zone, it's very expensive, and a lot of young people can't afford it, so then they tend to go further inland where properties were uh, more um, affordable to build. And, and I think that's one of the main reasons, but we have been blessed here because all of our properties that you can see around us has been um, inhabited by um, descendants of our parents and grandparents. Prophetess, what do you think? Um, I agree with her because economics plays a great deal in it. it. It costs a lot to build houses over here. So it is ways that, in a sense, it kind of binds you in terms of having to build your property yourself. And one thing I'm grateful for is that our forefathers is that they left this inheritance 
And just like the Word of God tells us to leave an inheritance for your children and your children's children, and that is what they have done. And it saddens me when uh, the property is being sold because to me what they did for us, you can't put a monetary value on it. And I think some goes back to in uh, educating them the importance of what was given to us.